theme of my presentation will be Mac OS X or how Apple learned to stop worrying and fell in love with Unix. Uh, my name is Mladen Djuric. Uh, I'm uh, working in a company called Bluefish, which is not too much relevant. Uh, I've been uh, in IT industry since, well, maybe too long. Uh, I started uh, with uh, first personal computers around 1978. Uh, yes, that was in, in last century. And uh, actually, I started with, with some uh, pocket, uh, pocket calculators that were able to be programmed. And that's how I got hooked in, uh, in my fourth grade in elementary school. Uh, before that, I decided to take Mathematics University, but then when I when I faced the, the, the possibility of programming, I thought, well, math is fine, but I think I'd I'd, I'd prefer to go for uh, for something computer related, and uh, well, as as many uh, people from my generation, and I'm talking about I'm born in 1966. Uh, yeah, that's that's very long time ago, but st still I can feed myself and walk without chairs, so that, that's that's a nice achievement. And I still remember who I am in the morning. I don't have to read Q papers. So, uh, what I wanted to tell you is that unfortunately I dropped out of university. Uh, I'm not too proud of that fact. Uh, however, it was 90s. Uh, that was a war in some country called Yugoslavia and it was not jolly too much to, to go to university at that time. Uh, so I figured out it would be better for me to, to go to, to work and I started working almost in 1988. So that's something about me. Uh, this is how are we going to present the things. This is some, some schedule that I had in my mind. Uh, these are the things I'd like to talk to you about. The main question that we're going to address today is uh, how Apple became Unix-based or oriented and how they made the transition from their own operating system to the one that everyone knows today as Mac OS X. Uh, I will try briefly to look on the uh, history of operating systems and uh, although it said that Apple as company I will move that to to end uh, and then we will see something about the corporate policy and uh, I think those are all things that are nice to know uh, but at any time if, if any of you have some questions please please just be free, free to ask here is the microphone so you just raise your hand and and I will I will instruct our guy to, to pass you the microphone. Uh, apparently I'm not a native English speaker, so I could be mixing something from American English or from British English or whatsoever. Uh, I may make uh, grammatical mistakes. It's not easy to, to speak foreign language, but I will try to do my best. So, we already told who I am. That's not important. On, on the many nets, you may find me as, as Mac Mladen, but that will not help you as far as I'm not using Facebook, I'm not using Twitter. Uh, I will eventually went into that, but hey, I'm the old guy, so I don't have to do that. Uh, also, my company actually sells Apple computers. Uh, actually, I did sell them um, by being authorized by Apple, but Apple is a strange moving company, so they decided to have some policy about me paying them for selling their machines, and I was not comfortable with that, so I, I just said, okay, I don't need that. So. Uh, Basically, I am affiliated with Apple Computer, not directly, but indirectly, but I'm not living from, from that business, so actually I don't care if they like what I'm talking about or they don't like. Uh, also, there are many myths about Macs, Mac operating system, and uh, Apple, and Steve Jobs, and openness. Uh, I can talk much more than you can stand. So please feel free to interrupt me if, I'm, uh, if you need something 
more I will try to be very brief on each thing, uh, uh, not, to, not to get into the other term of, of the next presenter. So let's look about the operating system history. I will try to, to make some very quick overview of what was happening in the computer era. Uh, before the computers, such as you know it, as a PC on your desktop, or laptop or anything similar, uh, before that computers were mainframes. Usually they were secured by a very secure room with some guys that were like security guys from here, so something like this. Uh, uh, you, you were very hard to pass through those people to see the actual machine and the first hard disk, uh, I saw it, I mean I, I didn't only saw it, I, I was actually working on it, it was something like 5 megabytes, yes it's ridiculously low capacity and it was like, like this size. Um, in the, for instance something where in, in 70s uh, there was some trend emerging like computers should be small, they were progressing and being smaller and smaller and one of the first machines was Altair uh, it was Altair 8800 in case anyone heard about that one it was, it was a cube like, like this and it, it, was, it was very funny at that time anyway uh, didn't do much but that was something like a first step that you can step into. You could buy it for as cheap as a few thousand dollars, maybe, maybe five, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the entry price point. So it was very, very cheap comparing to multi-million uh, mainframes that were in existence before that. And at that time, uh, in the 70s, uh, small computers starting to emerge, having something that could hardly be called operating system. You can see some of those machines in the hall where, where the guy is presenting them as some vintage machines. Uh, they were really the early era. But uh, that was one, one side track. The main track was uh, on proprietary operating system, like uh, IBM had its own. Uh, actually, they had a few operating systems uh, that, were, that were running on their machines. Uh, there were companies like uh, Digital Research, there was companies like uh, Pro, uh, uh, VEX, VMS, and, and what, whatsoever. So let, let's not go into too much of the history. But anyway, on, on those DEC machines, there were kind of the mainframes, usually in the universities, uh, something new happened. And that was, that was the project of the operating system that was about to be born. And the first, the first kid was Unix. Actually, it was not called Unix at, at, at the very beginning. Uh, it was called Unisys. And in case you could see Unix, uh, it's something like uh, universal networking and, and whatsoever. It's, it's not too much relevant. But you can see here the families uh, that were born from the, from the Unix. Uh, I, I will I will make this presentation as PDF available so, so you may download it and, and read it uh, somewhere somewhere after. Anyway, uh, Unix was born by Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie and the guys you know maybe who were the, actually the fathers of the C language. Uh, C language was born from a B language that existed before that, yes really. Uh, a didn't exist as far as I know. Maybe uh, at any time. I mean, my knowledge is not absolute one. So if, if anyone can correct me, please do so. Uh, do, do so. In the meantime, I will try to, to present what I do know. So uh, this was this was Unix. It was uh, born in early 70s, and actually the Unix time, as some of may know it. Like, like in Linux, when you say time, you get some, something like 13 billion and something like seconds. It actually starts from the 1st January of 1970. So it is the grandfather of, of, main, not main, of the major operating systems uh, in use today, except for one operating system that we will get to later. Uh, here's some, some system that is called CPM. Actually, it was called Control Program and Monitor that was uh, for uh, 
for 8-bit machines, th this screen is actually from the IBM PC, but the system was, was uh, in, brought to life much earlier than that. Actually, um, uh, microprocessor Z80 from the company Zilog or uh, Intel 8085. Uh, does anyone know what was the number of the first microprocessor ever produced? I, I was hoping the kids will know it. So kids, kids, kids. You have to learn the history. Intel 4004. Yes, it was... For, for it was it was Intel built. First first one was 4004. The next one was 8008. And then the 8-bit revolution started actually with 8080. The next generation from that 8-bit was actually 8085. Uh, of course, many of you know it as X86. X86 was actually the microprocessor that Intel wanted to produce, but IBM said, no, no, it's, it's just too costly. We can afford it. We are a poor little company uh, owning about 95% of the world at that moment. And they didn't want to buy 16-bit processor, that is uh, X86 family. Actually, they, go, they went for 8085 and made some motherboard that was, that was ridiculous. There was some guy that actually at that time, I'm, I'm not sure that if, he, if he even had a beard, so it was that young. His, his name was uh, uh, William Gates something junior. Friends call him Bill and they call him still today because he's still alive, unlike the other one. Uh, and that guy saw the opportunity to sell to IBM some system that actually was not CPM, but it is so similar to CPM uh, that, uh, so this is DOS and this is CPM. Even if you look at the commands, they're nearly similar. So CPM was quite nice operating system and actually it made a foundation for what Bill Gates later produced as a, a CPM for, uh, I mean, uh, he produced it as Microsoft DOS. Actually, uh, CPM also was in, in race for IBM PC computer. It was called, of course, CPM slash, uh, CP, CPM slash M86, but IBM did not go for that. I don't know why they chose Bill, chose his basic, chose to, to, to put everything inside and make something. Uh, before that, there was some, some machine that came earlier. This is actually Apple II. And uh, on the top you see that number two is uh, put like two brackets. And that was the original, that was the original one, really. Of course, it, there was an Apple I before that, but the Apple I was a funny story as uh, uh, two guys, two Steves, one is Steve Jobs, the other one is Steve Wozniak, they decided to make some Computer. Let's let's make a computer. And then uh, Wozniak, uh, at that time HP engineer, said, "Okay, I can do it." Uh, Steve Jobs went to find some money, and then came to Wozniak and said, "Wow, dude, I've got a fantastic job." He said, "Okay, what's on? We have to uh, we have to make 800 machines." So um, many of you have never done, uh, I suppose, soldering or made, making printed circuit boards or something like that. For the first purchase, Steve Wozniak actually made all 800 pieces. So he made printing boards, he soldered components and made actual computers. It was in a wooden case. Uh, so it was really ridiculous. But after that, they made a company and Apple II was the first serious uh, personal computer, you, you can see that it had floppy disks. At that time, floppy disks were actually 8 inch. It is like, like this size, approximately. I have one. Uh, this was ridiculously small, 5 and a quarter. It's like, like this, for instance. And after that, first Macintosh used actually 3.5 floppies. So, after, after that, uh, Apple. What, what was really interesting about this computer? Steve Wozniak made it completely. 
So he made hardware, he made software, he made operating system, he even built those uh, disk drives, he, he built video graphics, everything was in his head and everything was engineered and produced by him. Uh, that is not going to happen anymore. Uh, here is IBM PC DOS. Uh, I would say that we don't need much time talking about that one. Uh, it was born in early 80s and actually survived until, until 2000 or something. I'm not sure about that, when it was officially killed. Uh, in the meantime, there was some, uh, some interesting uh, try from the company called the Digital Research. They tried to make some, some sort of, of, of Windows. Uh, this actually worked on IBM PC computers. And that was the first option that you had, uh, I mean, that I had when I was working with uh, um, desktop publishing software like Ventura Publisher. So that was the operating system that enabled me to have on-screen fonts to, to, to make pre-press and, and printing. Uh, that was only because I was a poor guy at that time. Not much better now either. Uh, anyway, I couldn't afford myself Mac. This is the first Mac desktop. It's the first, uh, as you can see, even the screen is very small. It's something like, like 300 something and, and 200 something pixels. So some of you guys, not some of you, I believe many of you have a bigger screen on your mobile phone than, than that was. Actually, the computer looked like, um, like, uh, like, uh, like, 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 like this one. So this is the first Mac but we will, we will get to that uh, much, much later. Uh, so, uh, Mac, Mac, okay, everyone knows the story. So, uh, Steve Jobs actually stole it from the Xerox, right? Not so right. We could say that he did steal. Actually, he didn't steal it. Um, they went to Xerox, which was at that time it was open company. Anyone could, could come and, and see what are they working for on. And uh, Steve Jobs, with some guys from the from the Apple company at that time, they just got a bunch together and went to visit them. Uh, of course, the people at Xerox were thrilled that someone was looking at their operating system. Uh, but their operating system that was based on the WIMP paradigm. Does anyone know what the WIMP stands for? Zilch. Jesus Christ. WIMP stands for Windows Icon Mouses Pointers. So it was Douglas Egbert that made the mouse. He died a few months ago, unfortunately. But what was the case? Xerox had that operating system working on a computer that was about this big. So actually, you could not use it for something usable. You, you, you would need a few million bucks, and at the end, all you could do is just move windows. So it was not much of an operating system, actually. Um, uh, it's, it's a very interesting story how they came about the first Mac, but I will not bug you with that, because the time is ticking. Uh, actually, uh, there was some project that was called Lisa, uh, uh, the, the Steve Jobs required from the engineers to make something cheap. And they came up with Lisa. And it was as cheap as 10,000 bucks. And, and uh, he said, right, not good. Go back to drawing board and do it again. Uh, that team that was on the Lisa production actually didn't make it. And then he, he got some uh, new talented people, some very, very young people, all engineers in the company were insulted because that, that young man wasn't an engineer at all. He was just a, uh, he was just a hobbyist. Uh, but actually that guy uh, uh, made a concept to put many integrated circuit chips into the one custom-built chip. That chip alone bring the price for the initial Mac from $10,000 to $2,500. Now that was much much better because average salary was something about three or four thousand dollars. So average family could buy it. Even there was um, there was an, uh, there was discount for uh, uh, for a school maybe not so sure but for the students uh, it cost only one thousand dollar. And guess what? When you buy first when you when you bought the first Mac, 
you could get a, um, you, you could get a, um, a bag that will allow you to carry it. Of course, you couldn't carry it because it was something like 10 or, or uh, it's around. No, it's not 10 kilograms. It, it's 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 easier than that. But anyway, you, you should be very very strong to carry it around. But still, it was nice bag where you put the Mac, put the keyboard, put the mouse, put the cable, and everything was about this size. So it was pretty pretty neat. At the same time. So this was happening in 1984. In the previous presentation, uh, you saw that uh, that thing about 1984, uh, about George Orwell. Uh, for all you young people, I strongly recommend you to read the book, George Orwell, 1984. It is a fantastic piece of work. Unfortunately, uh, some took it as a manual, as the previous presenter said. That, that's, that's not too good, but that's the way things are. We can still make a difference. So, uh, in, in January of 1984, actually, Mac emerged with this operating system. There is one movie called Pirates of the Silicon Valley. It is a very good one. Uh, it is about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates... Uh, uh, and and the and the born of of Mac and the company and it, it it is it is a good movie and it's very interesting, but what was even more interesting for Steve Jobs, uh, uh, let 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 me first thing first. Uh, Steve Jobs was not a nice man. He was very he was very hard. I mean he's nice when he is something like three four thousand miles away from you. Then he's very nice man. But actually in person he was very. Uh, he was very. He, he he knew how to be very rude to people, and um, in 1985, so it is one year after the introduction of the Mac, uh, Bill Gates came out with this fantastic operating system. Uh, actually, the clock was graphic, and the game was graphic, but everything else wasn't. It was actually character based, and this is Windows, as you see, it 1.1. Uh, it's it's a real thing, yes. It, it looked like that. I, I didn't use it, I must say. I, I started using Windows 2, which was a little less rubbish than this one. And of course, Jobs went furious. He called Bill and demanded that he immediately come to his company. And Bill, he likes to travel and he like, okay, I'll go, I don't care too much. And uh, uh, they say that Steve Jobs was yelling at him, calling him names. Uh, uh, how could he steal their technology? It is licensed. And then Bill said to, to Jobs, well, listen, Steve. Uh, 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 Steve actually was a dropout from... from, 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 from some college where, where he was not learning engineering. He was actually, he's not an engineer, he's not a programmer at all, uh, and he was studying something like arts. And on the other hand, William Bill Gates is a lawyer, and he studied law school. And uh, after this ranting from the jobs, uh, Bill said, uh, well, Steve, you should better learn to read papers that you sign, because on the paper, uh, you allow us to use technology like three years later. And Jobs said, yeah, three years later, but this is 85 and that was 84. No, Steve, it's your problem. Mac should be out in 1982, so actually we are allowed to make it in 1985. So that is how Windows 1 became to existence. However, it is really not, and it wasn't usable at all, even at that time. But that was experiment for him. And the next thing was, Windows 3. I don't believe that many of you have ever seen it. Uh, actually, it is much better. It, to you, it, does, it doesn't look like much better, but actually it did because <laughs> uh, you don't know, but these windows are not resizable. They're fixed in size. So you cannot make them bigger or smaller. And in Windows 3, actually, you can resize the windows. So that was an achievement for, for the little Bill. And at the same time, Mac went much further, going into real graphic operating system. This is, this is something for uh, system 
I'm not sure, maybe system six or uh, many systems from, from system six to system eight were very similar. And uh, we joked about why, why is Mac better? Because it starts with a smile. You see? Smile. There's a smiling face looking at you and it, it's just a nicer uh, way to start the day. Uh, so, uh, let's see where we are at the moment. Uh, in this history, at, at this time, we are in early 90s, something like 92, 95. This is the time range when these operating systems are emerging. Uh, Windows 95 emerged and they say, wow, this is the revolution. You can have your file name bigger than 8. Yes, until Windows 95, your file names had to be 8.3 in length. Not longer than that one. Mac, of, not, not Mac, even Apple II could have a file name like 35 letters and you can have spaces in your file names. But uh, as much as Billy was happy with his Windows 95, Apple were actually in a big trouble. And that is what this talk is actually all about, about that trouble. They were trying to make a next generation operating system. They had some kind of a software, Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, Adobe InDesign, uh, no. Uh -huh. In design came much later. So there was some bunch of Adobe software, there was some bunch of the Microsoft software. Uh, for instance, maybe you don't know, but Microsoft Office, such as Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, actually originates from Mac. So the Billy was commissioned to do that job for Mac. And, and only when Windows had the capability to do so, then he made an office for, for Windows. But initially, it was made for Mac. So uh, they had a lot of legacy applications, and they, they were something like, we made an operating system, which was very well. It had uh, 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 color control. Windows could only dream of color control. It was famous for media production, for uh, desktop publishing, for video production, for audio production. So, uh, although at that time, and even now, even now, and at this time, Mac takes maybe 8, maybe 9%, Mac, like Mac machine. But in the media production industry, that is video production, audio production, web production, uh, Mac is something like 80%, maybe even more. So, uh, Apple had the problem, they wanted to move their operating system further. So they wanted to make something uh, that will be able to cope with the future hardware. Uh, and the future hardware is what are we going to talk about. But, let's get back to this one. So, they wanted to have modern operating system. They wanted to have threads. They wanted to think about having multiprocessor doing the same job. At that, today, you take it as granted, because even your mobile phone has two, two cores doing something like that. At that time, it was very hardly imaginable. You can, you can have uh, SMP, that is something like uh, simple multiprocessing and symmetrical multiprocessing, thank you. And there was, there was some other thing. I'm not so, so sure about it. But uh, those technologies were emerging. Uh, video production needed more power, and the processors at that time uh, just couldn't deliver that power. So uh, there was a question uh, where we should go next. And that question was so much serious that at that time, Apple actually started three routes different to upgrade their own operating system. One route was Copeland, the other route was Telligent, and the third route was very ill, and, and I, I don't remember what was, what was the name of it. But actually, Telligent was the project between Apple and IBM. 
it was supposed to be component oriented object oriented distributed operating system where where you could buy just one component that you need and don't buy anything that you don't need we are talking about the computers that at that time had a little memory uh, disk was constrained everything was constrained uh, but uh, the Copeland was their in-house project and they tried to build in multi-threading into the operating system they couldn't do it I mean they, they did have some success but actually it was just not working and they were facing problems in 94, in 95, 96, 97 98 uh, it was like cut it no way, no can do actually in 1996 uh, Apple board which uh, phased out Steve Jobs out of the company in 1985 uh, in 1996 they decided that there is some basis to bring him back to company uh, so Apple tried to evolve their operating system and they just couldn't do it although their operating system at that time was much better than, than Windows the next thing that came was the chip battle so Apple figured out that they need new hardware Motorola 68000 and the family of the chips the, the latest was 68040 it was just not delivering the performance it was not living up to time and they have to do something about it uh, so they made an epic meeting with the guys from IBM with the guys from Motorola and themselves uh, at that time IBM they were called like FBI they were called suits because they had a corp corporate policy that insisted that all IBM employees should be in suits on the other hand in, uh, in the Apple everybody was wearing t-shirts sneakers they didn't care much about the dressing code or something like that so when they get to the first secret meeting of course it was like IBM guys were told listen we are going to meet Apple they are some kind of a small company but let's let's respect them so don't wear suits just take the t-shirts and, and and let's be casual atmosphere at that time Apple uh, guys were told listen we're meeting an IBM the IBM the big one so please leave your t-shirts buy some suits and, and please let us look at least once let us look like a company of course Motorola guys were their way uh, actually why did those three companies meet at all uh, Apple was ready to move on but needed chips Motorola had the best risk technology at that time it was the next generation 88,000 chips that no one were using and IBM had the best architecture that 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 promised to be uh, to have a long life that was power architecture uh, power is acronym for something but I don't know it it's it's not relevant for the moment so three companies decided to make one chip that chip was called uh, power PC this is the first one uh, it was actually produced by IBM in the beginning uh, after that it was Motorola manufacturing the the chips the chips as chips but IBM also <laughs> produced them uh, they were they were the basis of the first Max after the Motorola 68000 uh, uh, so uh, chips so so they had a very big problem and that problem was how will we make the transition from the chips we were using to the chips we will be using uh, uh, that is that is the biggest switch I think in technology and in industry as a whole if you if you look better at the PC platform today uh, it is not much of a different from the first PCs 
uh, I can talk about that as well, but we will skip it. Uh, so Apple was transitioning uh, its operating system, its application, and as far as the users were concerned, it went just like without any problem. So the legacy software continued working on the new hardware, and from the software base, it was extremely complicated. Uh, engineers from Apple hardware were telling stories after that, that uh, uh, they were recompiling operating system uh, over and over again. Uh, for instance, they would tell them, uh, okay, tomorrow we will use MIPS chips. Okay. Then they say, no, 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 it will not be MIPS, it will be 88,000, okay. No, 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 we will use Intel chips. And they say that uh, after half a year switching with the chips, they said that they were so proficient in compiling a new core and, and operating system and everything else that they could switch in a week to completely different architect architecture. That is the very, very important thing to learn at the moment. Uh, when they brought back Steve Jobs, they brought with him the new thing, and that new thing is called Next Step, actually, not Mac OS X. We will return to that story, but let us see how the next look like. Uh, this, is the late, the, this is the last Next that were actually produced, and this is the first one. So it looked like a cube. Uh, it, was, it was completely out of time. So it used the custom Motorola 68000 chip that was not available. It was the strongest ever built. It used the magneto-optical drive instead of the, the, the floppy disks. And uh, uh, it cost something about $6,500. But this was the high-resolution screen uh, and uh, the display was postscript-oriented. I think that, that nothing means to you, but, but the question is, anyone knows this one machine? Not you again! <laughs> oh, let's see who's youngest. So you! Right! That, uh, if, I, if I had brought some prize, I would give it to you. Really, yes, that is, that is Tim Lee Burns' machine, and you can see the sticker. Uh, this machine is something, do not power it. <laughs> so, because, of course, you, you would power down the computer, but that was actually the first web server. Uh, this is, uh, this, ah, these papers are, you can find it on that, it, it's, it's not. What? Yes, in, in Switzerland. So, let's get back to, to, to the thing that we're actually talking about. So, uh, Apple uh, was going nowhere with their operating system, and, uh, uh, and, they, and the new hardware was emerging, and they had to do something. In 1996, in September, I think, they finished the talks with the next company, Steve Jobs, namely, and they brought him back to company. Uh, they gave him open hands to do whatever he likes to do, and the first thing he done was to dump the operating system. It's a legend that he also said, uh, let's dump the PowerPC chip, it's, it's no use. He wanted to use Intel chips at that time, but they say, no, 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 we invested too much in this technology, let's try to push it further. So they said, okay, uh, when they, when they uh, uh, were in the transitioning process, oh, oh, oh yes, there is one very interesting thing. When, when the guy called Bill Gates heard about the Copeland, Copeland actually uh, had three boxes. That is something like, uh, that is something we today call virtualization technology. Actually, Copeland was from the beginning thought that it should run three operating systems uh, or support applications from three operating systems. It was supposed to drive legacy Apple applications. 
it was supposed to drive new applications that will be written specially for, for, for this one. Uh, the legacy box was called one was called blue box, one was called yellow box. I'm not sure at the moment which one is, is which. And the third box, watch it, was supposed to run Windows applications natively. Uh, when the guy called Bill Gates heard for that idea, he suddenly fell in love with Apple company and they paid something like 200 million dollars not to happen. So they say, okay, it will not happen. We don't care much about it. And then they made Mac OS X. Uh, in the previous system, it was called System 1, System 2, System 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. After System 7, they should change it, but they didn't manage. So they made System 7, System 8, and eventually they made even System 9 while they were waiting for the, for the new thing. So uh, OS X... Uh, uh, got the name like X, like Unix, and like X, like Roman 10. This is the this is the screen uh, boots. I mean, after the booting, this is the desktop of a 10.2 operating system. What Apple actually did to make Mac OS X happen? Uh, while they were looking for the good base, actually they switched over to Jobs. Jobs at that time was not constrained by some company. He had his own company where he done what he wanted. And the basis of the next machine was actually the FreeBSD, Unix operating system. FreeBSD was used with, with some parts. Some parts were used from NetBSD and they made a new foundation that was truly Unix based. That truly Unix based enabled them to have a good foundation, but they still had a problem. Okay, we had a good foundation, but what will happen to our legacy applications? Uh, remember the, the, the story with the Copeland? They did have the box. So what they did was to make the layer, abstraction layer, between the uh, Darwin-based Unix, so Darwin's, Darwin was evolved from, from FreeBSD, so they, had, they have their own version that was called Darwin. On the top of the Darwin, there were some, some toolboxes that were connecting different interfaces. Of course, one of the interfaces could be Windows, but we remember that Billy paid, so we didn't do it. Actually, the only thing that was done were two boxes. One was the legacy box, and one was the new box. Legacy box enabled even programs, so, so listen to this carefully, even programs that were written for the initial Mac were running on Intel-based Mac many, many decades, not many decades, one decade and, and many years later. So it was something like, how the hell did you manage? That was the story that they needed to be very flexible, they had to get very good engineering to adopt to different processors. So if they'd done it in the past, they were very easily to make these compatibility boxes and the new Macs were running old software and were open for the new software. And that was, that was the main secret how they made the transition from the first Mac to the current one. The current one is called 10.9, it's called Maverick, but I don't care about, about, uh, about those names. And actually, they are very, um, that operating system uh, brings many, many, many things, but um, I would not take too much time uh, explaining all the technology but because it would be much more like marketing thing and I don't, I don't wish to do that. You can always jump to Wikipedia uh, where, where you can find um, many information about Mac OS and everything else. Uh, why is Mac uh, so successful? And how did they manage to be so successful? The first and most important thing is they don't care about the hardware. They didn't care in the past. They have good engineering. They have the solid base. So they switched easily from Motorola to PowerPC, from PowerPC to Intel, from Intel to ARM. 
Uh, ARM, of course, you all know what the ARM is. Uh, ARM uh, are famous architectures that are powering most of the mobile phones and devices at the moment. Uh, in very near future, they will power uh, servers in, 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 in data centers as well. And I uh, wholeheartedly recommend you to come tomorrow uh, to the presentation of Raspberry Pi, that is small ARM-based computer. It's a very interesting one. Um, but how did Apple manage to do all the things? Not caring for hardware, they can easily transition to mobile phones. When it was presented in 2007 as the first iPhone, everyone ridiculed it. Saying like, yeah, you are making mobile phones. Yeah, we know that. Asus tried that. HP tried that. Many companies tried that, but they didn't manage. So, what is it that Apple done and that others didn't? That's the integration. Even today, if you're writing some code for Mac or for, for some iPhone or iDevice, I you can rest pretty sure that your code base will need just minor changes and minor adjustment and new recompilation to work on the latest device. That's the secret ingredient. Apple was always very caring about uh, their own developers and they're protecting them much more than Google and Android company is. Actually, I was expecting to be uh, uh, to have the rant from your side about Apple not being open, but that didn't happen, so let's skip it. Uh, anyway, uh, developing for Mac is the same as developing for iPhone, is the same as developing for iPad, is the same as developing for Apple TV, uh, and probably, maybe, God knows only, uh, tomorrow we will maybe have some Apple television set that will operate something somehow, maybe watches, we don't know that, but on the 10th of the September they will present new iPhone that I don't care too much about. So. Uh, is that they make your needs. Uh, many uh, very successful web companies uh, made their success by following that strategy. So it is not about uh, making uh, something uh, just to be better than someone else. Like Microsoft tried to make Microsoft shop and failed. Failed because it was not that they wanted shops. They just wanted something that Apple was already doing. It was the same with the Zoom project. It failed. It must fail because it was not, nothing was new about it. Uh, for instance, take, take iPad. Uh, it is tablet. Uh, there were tablets before iPad, but they didn't make it. There were, uh, there were phones before iPhone, I mean smartphones. Uh, Blackberry died in two-year frame. Why? Because they didn't care. They just thought that, that it, they, they, they took it for granted. And when Apple was designing phone, it was not about the phone. It was about the concept of living. It's about an idea. So the first thing is that they don't actually care what are you asking them to do. If you're asking them to make the car or make a bike, okay, they don't care. Uh, they're trying to see what their market could be and then to make the market, actually. Especially if that doesn't exist. Uh, it was a strange thing with iPhone because the market did exist and smartphones did exist. But the success of the iPhone and iPad and Mac and everything else is the second thing that they're good at. It is the integration. So it is very seamless when you, uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, who, uh, he got robbed and his phone was, was gone. Uh, he bought a new one and as soon as he typed in his own password and username, everything was restored. Uh, messages, uh, data from applications, application, everything was back in the phone. And he said, oh, look, I bought, I bought my own phone because it looks the same. Everything is the same. Everything was in the minute he stopped using it. 
So that is that is the second that is the second secret. Uh, try not to to make customers do what you want to do. Uh, you must let them do their job, and your job is to move away. That's the Apple's policy. That is why Mac laptop or, or, or desktop is so popular among designers. Uh, they don't care about files, operating systems, disks. They want to get the job done. And, and, and Mac OS is pulling away from that. Uh, as we're approaching uh, near end, I will just briefly go over Apple as a company and then allow you to maybe address with some questions. So, here is how Apple started. As you can see, the first logo, it was as ugly as some uh, interpreter from now Sad would like to have. Uh, something like Karic Brothers or, or <laughs> some other criminal uh, company from Serbia. Uh, almost immediately, so it was not, not more than, than, than a year, they brought the famous uh, stripped uh, logo of the Apple. Uh, even uh, uh, there are many false stories about how that logo came up. Uh, they called it uh, it's an apple like, like a temptation of the Adam and Eve and, and you can see the, 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 the apple is actually bitten that that is because Adam did that before he was from the paradise and so uh, not so true. Actually uh, they compare it to the Oh. I wanted to say Trashnia, but somehow it slipped my mind how it's called in, in, in English. Cherry, cherry. cherry, really. So it, was, it looked like cherry, and they didn't want to look it like cherry, so they added a bite. Uh, in 2000, it was just remodeled. I mean, why is it in colors? Because they wanted to present themselves as a colorful company. IBM was all blue. And it was something like Dark Ages and something like that. And they said, no, 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 no. We are a jollyful company full of life. And actually, those stripes are the basic colors that were used on the Apple screen. Because Apple was one of the first color screen computers. So that is why that was important. Uh, this one is, of course, more mature, where they removed everything and just left the, the essence. When you hear the term garage company, here is the garage where that happened. Uh, that was the, the, the home of Steve Jobs, and that garage actually was his, his father, who his father was, was, was actually not an engineer, but, uh, but he, he, he had an engineer way of thinking, and that was passed on uh, to Jobs. Uh, so that, that's, that's where, where it all started. Uh, we already saw this, this one, this little guy. Um, on, the, on the front side, there you can see the switch for turning it on. Uh, the, the, the size of it is something like, it was this wide, this high, and approximately this deep. So it was, it was actually very easy to, 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 to put on a, on a working table and, and to work on. Uh, you could put keyboard and the mouse on the back. On the computer, you also had the printer port. And later, you have the SCSI connector. That's, that's an ancient technology. Um, in 1984, after the first Mac was out, oh, there is also one, one little sketch. Um, Steve Wozniak, that was the, the job's first partner and engineer, uh, decided to step out of the company. Everyone was shocked. Why would he do that? The company was successful, making a lot of money. But he's, he's a very special guy. I mean, Steve Wozniak, the, the, the other fat guy, actually. Um, uh, for the first Apple, he done everything. Engineering, programming, uh, everything. Uh, for the second Apple, he also did everything. And when it came to Mac, he said, uh, I won't do it. And when Steve said to him, why won't you do it? There is no reason for you. I mean, you're an excellent engineer. You, you have a vision. So, eh, if I cannot write everything, I will not particip participate in that. 
and okay, he left the company. But uh, after the Mac was announced, uh, Steve Jobs got into the trouble with the company. You know, it was not his company, it was public company. So the board of the directors decided to, to run him out of the company. And when he, when he got out of the company, he made the ne next computer and actually was quite successful with those. Um, many Swiss banks were based on next servers for, for the thing. When he returned to the company, uh, he made a fa famous advertisement uh, as Think Different. They used pictures of Pablo Picasso, of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, and many, many other important people that were important not only for the science or for the computers, but for humanity as such. And uh, the first thing he showed when he officially returned in company in 1997 was this little thing. It was called iMac. Uh, here on the screen you actually see first generation. Uh, uh, they were about this size. Something like the ball you see. Steve Jobs was maybe as big as I am. So that's the comparison of the machines. Uh, they had a CD drive. They have two speakers uh, here. You can see ports, actually. Uh, it had a USB port. Uh, for instance, maybe you do know that Intel invented the USB. But what you don't know is that USB was not in use until Mac made it uh, the only... Uh, so they, they had few interfaces of their own and they dropped it out for, for this one. The screen was rather small. It was like 800 times 600 pixels. But still, it was it was very, very neat machine. It was very popular in schools. And for instance, journalists also use it very much for typing everything else. Here are actually two friends. Uh, uh, let, let's not pretend it was otherwise. Of course they were friends. Uh, uh, Bill Gates has a much nicer nature. He's much nicer as, as, a, as a human than Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve Jobs uh, was something like when he was walking around the corridors of the company, everyone was running not, not, to, not to meet him because he was like, why are you doing that? You should do that. And Bill Gates is quite the opposite. He's just a nice guy going around, looking, checking, chatting with people. And this was the last appearance on All Things Digital. Uh, you may find it on, on YouTube. There are actually like eight or nine uh, videos uh, where they too are talking about the computer history. <laughs> the interesting thing is that Bill started to, to, to talk something about the... And then Steve Jobs said... Then Steve Jobs said, uh, okay, Bill, let me explain that. And he said, okay, <laughs> explain. Because actually, uh, Steve Jobs is much, much better presenter than, than the Gates ever were. So here it is. It is some, some, of, like, uh, some of the late last pictures. Uh, I mean, uh, here he's not so ill on, on the others. He is, was born in 1955, died away and that's it uh, I hope you enjoyed this brief history and in part it was it was uh, on, a, on Apple unfortunately I was talking too much and have no time for questions and everything else but I will I will be available uh, in the front of the lobby so in case you have any questions related to Apple or anything else please be free to ask thank you for your patience